All right, welcome everyone uh, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you may be, to our webinar on sports chaplaincy. This is something that is definitely a first for the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab. Uh, we've been aware of sports chaplaincy, of course, for any number of, of years and months, but this is the first time that we've offered a webinar on it. And so I'm really uh, excited that we've got Will Whitmore here with us to tell us a little bit more about what the field looks like, some of the research that he's done on it, and then maybe what it also might look like going into the future. So Will wears two really interesting hats. On the one hand, he's school minister for Mercersburg Academy in Pennsylvania. So he's doing chaplaincy within that educational context, but he's also a PhD student at the University of Gloucestershire in the UK. Uh, and those two things, uh, I would imagine that maybe you have come up with some ways that they overlap, but in a lot of ways they don't. So kudos to you for holding them together uh, in your daily life. Um, this webinar will be a little bit more presentation based than some, um, not super heavy, but in any case, I'm gonna hand it over to Will, who will go through a presentation and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. This is recorded as all of our webinars are. So if you miss something, uh, or miss a slide or whatever, that's not a problem. Uh, we'll post it on the website, send you a link to it afterwards, and you can always come back to it whenever you like. So with that in mind, Will, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Michael, and uh, thank you all for being present here today. Um, I'm really excited to be uh, here with you wherever you are um, and to share a little bit of my work and my research. Um, today, I really have two goals for us. Um, my first goal is for us to kind of take an understanding of what sports chaplaincy is and some of the general roles that sports chaplains fill. And then my next goal is for, to share my research on sports chaplains that are serving in the National Football League and the English Premier League. As Michael mentioned, I, I'm completing my dissertation work and my um, PhD thesis centered around chaplains in these two leagues. Fine. Um, one quick note before we jump into uh, this today, I'm going to focus on sports chaplains serving in the United Kingdom and the USA. Uh, this has really two reasons for it. Uh, one, this is the two places uh, where the leagues that I studied are. So it's helpful for me and uh, just I know those contexts better. Uh, but two, these are also the two major areas where we find sports chaplaincy um, and sports chaplaincy literature is coming out of. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. Um, there are sports chaplains who serve throughout the world. Uh, there are larger sports chaplaincy organizations in South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, um, just to name a few. But today we'll just focus on the UK and the US. So with that, let's just jump right in. So sports chaplaincy in the United States develops in the 1950s. And what we see is the rise of evangelical Christianity meets with the rise of professional American sports, particularly sports that begin to be played on Sundays. And in the late 1950s, there's a guy named Bill Glass who's playing football for the Detroit Lions. He wants to attend worship services on a Sunday, but he also plays football on Sunday. So he can't meet his professional obligation and his personal desire to attend worship. So Glass um, begins to offer devotional services uh, with his team, within his team. This continues to develop forward. And by the early 1970s, mid 1970s, every single NFL team, except one, had a chaplain who was working with them to offer these types of services. Around the same time, we begin to see other forms of sports chaplaincy develop in the US. And today, uh, Quite literally, chaplains serve to some extent in almost every single elite sport in the country. Now, before we go any further, I do just want to say that I'm going to be talking about chaplaincy in what I like to call elite sports settings. Uh, what I mean by this is professional sports, but also I would consider this elite amateur athletics, so things you might find at the Olympic level, people competing on the international level, uh, but also high-level Division I athletics, even D2 athletics. Um, those are what I would consider these elite sports settings. But as you can see, uh, just from this bullet point, this is just a, a, a handful of places where chaplains are serving in the U.S. Pretty much every single major professional league. Chaplains also have a wide presence in motorsports, uh, not just with specific racing teams, 
but also uh, with tracks. There's a lot of track chaplains throughout the country. There are golf chaplains, cycling chaplains, tennis chaplains, uh, and one chaplaincy I know about, but I'd love to do a little more research and interview on is a competitive tractor pulling chaplaincy, which I think would be a very interesting study to say the least. There are also collegiate athletics that are served by chaplains. Oftentimes these collegiate athletic chaplaincies uh, are made up of people who are on staff with either fellowship of Christian athletes or athletes in action. And they'll serve a variety of different sports um, and really function as a campus ministry. Now this is a really broad range of sports, a, lot, a broad range of the country and a broad range of interests. Um, and one thing to note about US-based sports chaplaincy is there, that broadness uh, is kind of left static in the sense that there's no one central organization or group that brings together all these things. Um, so there's no funnel where all these groups are going to one person or one office or one thing like that to receive resources. Um, so we have no central organization that helps coordinate, run, um, you know, provide professional development, things like that for sports chaplaincy in the United States. I will say that uh, sports chaplaincy continues to also be a growing field as well. Um, and so we see more chaplains working in this in the United States. Sports Chaplaincy United Kingdom uh, developed sometime in the 1960s. We know of a handful of parish priests who started to serve at local football, also known as soccer clubs. Uh, but the really key figure in the development of the UK's sports chaplaincy is a man by the name of John Boyers, who's the chaplain of, at Watford Football Club for about 20 years. But he's founds a group called SCORE, which was an acronym for Sports Chaplains Offering Resources and Encouragement in 1990. And this is really a group that provides a central place for sports chaplains to come and get resources uh, to help be trained and also provide them um, with support. Boyers went on to become the chaplain of Manchester United Football Club in, two, in 1992, um, and he was there for almost 30 years as the chaplain to uh, Manchester United. He recently retired. SCORE turns into a group called Sports Chaplaincy UK, and as of now, there are over 500 sports chaplains who are affiliated with the organization, and over two-thirds of professional English football clubs have a sports chaplain who is affiliated with Sports Chaplaincy UK. Uh, sports Chaplaincy UK affiliated chaplains serve a really wide range of sports, just like they do in the United States. They serve soccer, various codes of rugby, cricket, horse racing. Uh, cycling chaplaincy is something that's being developed. They also serve track and field, golf, and ice hockey. Um, and there's, that's an awesome expanding list of sports as well. One interesting place they're seeing a lot of growth right now is in the number of chaplains who are serving fitness centers or gymnasiums. And this is turning out to be a real fruitful space with having a chaplain affiliated and uh, practicing a ministry of presence uh, in that space. So that's a really interesting development um, in the United Kingdom. One of the things uh, that differentiates chaplaincy in the UK from the US is the, that there is this central group present that does help uh, coordinate and work with teams and other leagues and competitions or governing bodies to help put chaplains uh, with these teams or at places like a horse racing track and then keep them uh, offering them professional development and things such as that. Um, and that's actually, I think, a real strength of Sports Chaplaincy UK is that they have actually have formal affiliations with things like the Premier League, like the FA, the Football Association, the governing body of football in the United Kingdom, um, groups in Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland as well. And this really provides them with um, a level of access um, and legitimacy that um, it, I think is really beneficial to the group. Now, the majority of these chaplains, both in the U.S. and the U.K., are going to serve individual teams or at a place like a moto track or a horse racing track. But I did just want to make you guys aware briefly of what we call major events chaplaincy as well. This would be chaplains for things like the Olympics, the Pan American Games, or the Commonwealth Games. Um, this is a very select group. You actually have to go through an interview process, um, and all, mo oftentimes you they are looking for people who are already serving in elite athletics. Um, and many times they like people that are bilingual. And that's because you are there to serve everyone at the games. Um, these chaplains are not affiliated with a specific nation. So there's not a US-based chaplain, 
a Nigerian team chap, on an Australian team chap, on a Canadian team chap, on and so on and so forth. Uh, but really, they are a neutral presence at the games. Um, while there is a group that coordinates many of these things, uh, how many chaplains are welcome and things of that nature is dependent on the host committee um, welcoming those chaplains. So some events are more receptive than others, and that um, can provide those um, places for chaplains to enter. Other times, it's harder to place chaplains at these events. But there will be chaplains at the Olympics, at the Pan American Games, um, the World Youth Games, things such as that. Um, and that's also a growing field at this time. Um, I did just want to make a quick note. I apologize. I forgot to say this at the beginning. Um, after my presentation, we'll be taking some questions and answer, uh, doing some Q&A. If you have questions during this, please uh, don't hesitate to add those as you're thinking of them. And I'll have Michael take, uh, let us know what kind of pops up at the end of this. Um, so who are these people um, that are these chaplains? Well, the vast majority of them are volunteers. They're local pastors, they're lay people, or they may be staff members of a parachurch organization like Fellowship of Christian Athletes or Athletes in Action. Um, but the majority of them are volunteers that are working in some other form of ministry. Um, it is very rare for a sports chaplain to receive any financial compensation from the host organization they serve. I'm going to use this term host organization a lot. What I mean by that is the specific team or the racetrack that they are working at, that context they're working within. Um, chaplains who do receive financial compensation are oftentimes on a part-time basis. Uh, in my study, I interviewed eight chaplains, and only one chaplain received any financial compensation, um, and that he also did other work for this NFL team. Um, those who are full-time chaplains uh, sometimes are affiliated with Athletes in Action or Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and they fundraise their own salaries. So they're not receiving financial compensation from their host organization, even with that. And the majority of these chaplains are Christian. Um, all three of the groups I've talked about so far, FCA, Athletes in Action, and Sports Chaplaincy UK, are all Christian parachurch organizations. Um, and we do see a majority of sports chaplains identify um, with some branch of the Christian faith. Um, sometimes teams will even have two chaplains, a Roman Catholic chaplain and a Protestant chaplain, to serve um, the needs of uh, the people who are within that organization. Uh, because chaplains are volunteer, uh, much of what they do is also part-time. Chaplains usually commit to a few hours a week to serve their host organization, um, but this can vary widely depending on what time of year it is, if a team is in season or out of season, or if it's a game day. Um, for example, a lot of the chaplains I worked with in the UK had a presence on match day. So they would be at the game two, three hours before kickoff. They'd be there for the entirety of the game, about two hours. And they may stay for one to two hours after, depending on what the needs were. So you're looking at a five to six hour day on match day on top of other ministries or other things you're doing with that chaplaincy. So that's um, kind of present there as well. So that's who they are, but what do they do? Well, the two primary things that we've found and that I'll focus on are the religious duties typically associated with a minister um, and providing of pastoral care. So let's look at both of these and see what chaplains offer in this way. So chaplains offer, especially in the United States, a sports chaplain's primary role is to offer some form of a worship service. This is particularly true when a game, uh, when a team plays on a Sunday. So let's take both the NFL and Major League Baseball for example. These are leagues that play a lot on Sundays, almost every single Sunday. And athletes, uh, their time is not their own on game day, which can make it very challenging for them to attend a worship service in the local community. In the case of the NFL, uh, NFL teams, whether they're home or away, really become sequestered probably the evening, the dinner, uh, right around dinner time the night before a game. And so they're not even going to leave and go outside of the, the hotel the team's staying at or the stadium before a game on a Sunday. So they can't make it to a local church. So the chaplain is really serving a very utilitarian role in offering a worship service that um, these players may desire, or coaches or staff may desire, that their job makes it so that they cannot attend on a regular basis. So that's a really a big primary function, particularly in the United States. 
Chaplains are also often in the U.S. Um, asked to host a Bible study. Um, I know that in season, for example, the NFL, uh, their schedules are very tight and they're on a very uh, regimented schedule. So having a section of the week where this is being offered actually allows for a respite. And if the team can provide that, um, they also allow those people to receive this spiritual sustenance and the need that they have, but also um, not to, you know, say I'm leaving for two hours during the week when they're on kind of a regimented schedule with team meetings, with workouts, and things such as that. Chaplains also offer prayer. Um, I think oftentimes we see a, chap, a group of people huddled in the NFL around the 50-yard line at the end of a game. Sometimes chaplains are leading this, sometimes they're not. What we'll talk about in a little bit is how a chaplain, how much a chaplain can lead a prayer um, or how much they can interact in that way really depends on the expectations and access that a host organization has for said chaplains or for their chaplain. And so that's um, really dependent on what the organization desires. And finally, uh, chaplains also officiate what I call occasional offices. This would be things such as funerals, weddings, baptisms. In the United Kingdom, it is actually a fairly common occurrence where people will ask that their ashes be spread at their favorite football stadium's grounds. And this has actually caused a lot of UK soccer teams to have memorial gardens built at their stadiums or near their stadiums where ashes can be spread or even people can be interred. Um, so for example, uh, one of my friends is a chaplain in the second division and their memorial garden actually looks over the field at the stadium. It's one of only two or three in the entire country where um, you know, people can say they've spread their ashes of their loved one in a place where they can still see the game of the team they loved being played. Um, but oftentimes these chaplains will kind of be the official club representative or team representative at these spreading of ashes services. And they'll really create a service that's meaningful to the family and honors this person who has passed away. So that was something interesting that we found. Chaplains also provide pastoral care that's synonymous with chaplaincy overall. And this is being a listening and supportive figure for all in the club. Um, this goes for everyone from the janitor to the person who is the head of the organization. Chaplains are there to serve all regardless of who they are, what they believe, and what they don't believe. Um, and they're really there just to be that ministry of presence. And as we'll see in a second, the chaplains in my study really described their ministry as a ministry of presence oftentimes. But this idea of pastoral care we as chaplains or people who work in spiritual or faith-based uh, spaces may be comfortable with that, but it's a really antithetical thing to elite sports because the chaplain really is a neutral and confidential presence whose primary purpose is not to help the team achieve on-field success, which within these organizations and within this elite bubble that is elite sports, that is a very rare thing. If you think about it, the chaplain may be one of the only people who interacts with athletes and coaches on a regular basis who is not there to help them prepare for game day. This even goes for someone like the sports psychologist. Say I'm an elite athlete and I'm struggling with my marriage and I go to see our sports psychologist. You know, I'm sure the sports psychologist wants to see me flourish in my relationship and to, you know, to have that tension be resolved, but that's not the primary goal of the sports psychologist. The sports psychologist's primary goal in actuality is to make sure that whatever challenges I'm having in my marriage at home don't come with me onto the field of play. So help, the primary goal is to help train me to leave those things in the locker room or leave them at home so I can, be optim and I can perform in the most optimal way on the field. And then we can work out those other issues. But even that in that regard, that is not a neutral function for their goal is Yes, to provide a listening ear, but it's really to get these people prepared for game day. And so that neutrality of the chaplain being there to say, look, I'm here for you, win, lose, or draw, is a really rare thing. And it speaks against the performance-based identity that we often see in elite athletics. Um, you know, these are athletes and coaches who, how they are, you know, based not only their performance in their job, but also how they're received in the community and things like that is really dependent on how they perform on the field. 
And a lot of athletes, especially at the elite level, struggle with a performance-based identity. So having the presence of a chaplain who can say, I really want you to do well, but that doesn't change who I think you are and how I care for you, that can be a really revolutionary and a really uh, countercultural thing. But the chaplain is also a confidential presence. Let's go back to that sports psychologist. That sports psychologist may need to report to their direct report in the medical office of who they're talking to and what they're talking about. And the head of the medical staff may talk to the head coach and report those things as well. And so what was just now a very private matter for me as an athlete is now something my head coach knows. Or let's take the place of an injury. Say I say to the doctor, I feel like I'm being rushed back. I'm not as confident after I've just, you know, had a knee, knee injury of playing at my full potential. They could relay that to the coach, and that could hinder my playing time potentially, which could hinder my contract. So how you know, open do I want to be with people if I know that confidentiality won't be there? So being able to be confidential is huge. This is not something that is always honored by people in host organizations. Um, three of the NFL chaplains in the, uh, my study relayed the same um, story to me, and this is of a chaplain I didn't, I've never engaged with. But there was a new head coach in the NFL. He met with the chaplain. It's a fairly common occurrence when there's a new coach. And the coach said, um, you know, I'm going to need you to tell me who you're talking to and what they're dealing with. And the chaplain said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Uh, I, you know, I keep confidential what I talk about. And the coach said, well, then I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I'm, you know, you can't be a part of this organization if you're not going to help me in this way. And sure enough, that chaplain was removed and the head coach brought in a different chaplain who was kind of, he saw more favorably. Um, like I said, I don't know who this chaplain is. I've never interacted with them. Um, but that confidentiality can be something that goes against and challenges the place of the chaplain within the organization. Um, so I do, um, so that is a very interesting element there. So this kind of provides us a really broad brushstroke of who these chaplains are, where they serve, and what they do. Um, and so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to move into some of the findings that I found that I had in my current study. So I provide, uh, my PhD research was a small scale study, small scale study, small scale study, excuse me, of eight chaplains in the National Football League and the English Premier League, four chaplains in each league. We um, asked these uh, chaplains not only about their work, but also their background, uh, both in regards to their religious faith, both of so their education. We asked them about things like how they're evaluated and what kind of professional development they have and what kind of roles and expectations uh, the organization has for them. As I've said, eight chaplains were featured, four in each um, league, and I did semi-structured interviews with each chaplain over the course of the season. And I did field observations, uh, one, uh, one field observation in each league during my research as well. And so what we found was that these chaplains, their primary role was as a pastoral presence and as a religious leader. So very consistent with what I already discussed. We found that in the U.S., chaplains were really seen as a religious leader and pastoral presence was secondary, while in the U.K., pastoral presence was the primary element. UK-based chaplains used the phrase that they were pastorally proactive while being spiritually reactive. And this is something that sports chaplains at UK um, really uses a lot within their literature and in their training of chaplains. So if I'm a chaplain, I'm looking for pastoral situations I can engage with. But if someone, I'm not asking someone, can I pray with you? You know, have you ever talked about these things in a religious context? Those things have to be asked of the chaplain for them to initiate and engage in that way. Chaplains uh, throughout the study described their ministry as a ministry of presence, and they really wanted to be there for uh, people who were not just Christian members of the host organization. All eight chaplains I worked with uh, were Christian uh, pastors, and all were either ordained or had credentials to officiate weddings and be in some form of leadership within their denomination. But they sought to be a positive presence and to be a support for anyone at their host organization. Now, one of the interesting things with this was, did they get the opportunity to be that presence for people outside 
of a Christian lens. And what I mean by that is people outside of wanting in the U.S. context worship or Bible study and things of that nature. Because what we found that was very interesting and that the, our interviews kind of revealed, we didn't go in kind of knowing as much about this, was that the expectations and the access that the host organization provided to the sports chaplain really gauged how much they could, you know, use that ministry of presence and how present they could be. So when I talk about expectations here, I'm talking very basically about what the host organization expected from these chaplains. But when I talk about access, I'm not just talking about access to certain people, but I'm also talking about access to facilities and when they can access those facilities and for how long and on what days. Elite sports organizations are extremely closed off groups. Um, I actually struggled at times to gain access even for interview subjects um, because of these closed off nature. And that also kind of went hand in hand with chaplains and the access they had. So for example, some chaplains had access to the facility for Bible study, but didn't have access on game day. And those types of things gauged, um, kind of affected how much work they could do as a chaplain. What our study found was that the expectations and access go hand in hand. Those with more expectations tended to have more access, and those who had less expectations tended to have less access. So for example, one of the chaplains I worked with he was expected to be at every single game of the, the NFL season, home or away. And so he flew on the team, uh, plane, stayed with the team in the hotel, really interacted with them that way. And that provided a great space for him to build relationships because you're on a business trip with people. You're engaging with this limited group of people you're with. However, there was another chaplain I worked with who the only time he was allowed to be in the team facility was for the one hour a week he did a Bible study. He was not allowed to meander with intent in the facility. He was in and out quickly. He wasn't given access to the team or any of the staff on game day, except for after the game, he could visit with some players in kind of a meet and greet area that family and friends were in. And so he, while wanting a relationship with people like the medical staff, like the marketing department, wasn't given that opportunity. Chaplains recognized that, uh, or we found out that these were very contextual to the host organization, these expectations and access uh, elements. So what one NFL chaplain had for expectations and access, another might not have. What one Premier League chaplain may have, another might not have. The only expectation that was consistent for NFL chaplains was that they provide some form of worship service the night before a game. And if they could not attend that themselves, they had to vet and coordinate the person who would lead that service. Um, that was really the only consistent expectation. So they were extremely contextual to the host organization. The other thing we found is that these are not static. Um, the people who had wonderful expectations and access recognized that one wrong move, abusing the privileges that they had, or a change in management, be it at the coaching or at the executive level, could severely curtail the expectations and access they had. The amount of times chaplains said to me, I have great access and I cannot screw this up or I cannot take it for granted. I mean, this was consistent. Anytime these chaplains talked about how good they had it, they also recognized that this was not a static space, that this was not a guarantee in their ministry. What we found was that the key person in granting this access was often the head coach of the first team. I say the first team, NFL teams, there's only one team. But in the English Premier League, a club may have an under 23s team, a second team, a women's team, an under 19 teams, an under 15 teams, an under 12s team, and so on and so forth. But it was really the, that first team, those, that group that plays in the Premier League, it was that coach that set the tone for the entire organization. And cha chaplains described how shifts in coaching were a time of unease for all at the club, including themselves. People didn't know if they would be moved on in their jobs, if their philosophies or approaches to athletics didn't agree with the, um, with the coaches, the new coaches perspective, but also chaplains recognized that if this coach did not want a certain, um, a certain, you know, Ex they didn't have an expectation of chaplaincy or they had a negative view of chaplaincy, they might curtail their access. Uh, one of the chaplains I worked with 
uh, he used to sit on the bench at one of the developmental team's games as just to be a positive presence, didn't do anything with the coaching. Um, this was in, the, it was, is in, it was in England. Uh, and the, co the head of the first team went to a game, saw this, didn't like it, asked that the chaplain not sit with the U23s anymore, and pretty much was blackballed from the group uh, organization while that coach was there. Because the coach had limited his access in one area of the club, others were nervous to be affiliated with the chaplain. And so while that coach was present, he really, this chaplain struggled to engage with people. But regardless of the expectations and access, what we found was that chaplains did not receive a lot of accountability from their host organizations. Um, chaplains talked about desiring accountability from the host organizations, wanting their work to be evaluated by this group in a formal way, but that organizations either didn't have the resources or the time to do it, or frankly, the care. One of the chaplains I uh, chatted with actually came up with a survey for athletes who had come to his Bible study and worship services and came up with a pretty detailed self-reflection at the end of the year. He presented this to his direct report at the end of the year. The guy took one glance at it, put it on the other end of his table, and went on with his conversation. So it didn't even seem that the work that this chaplain had done to reflect on his year in ministry was that desired by the club. Now, uh, athletes, or sorry, not athletes, chaplains who are associated with parachurch groups like Athletes in Action had self-evaluations with this parachurch organization, but they were largely um, but they were largely self-responsive uh, and there was very little interaction with people at the host organization or someone coming in and evaluating the work of the chaplain. Those chaplains who were associated primarily with a congregational, uh, with a congregation as their primary point of ministry, had almost zero accountability for their chaplaincy in regards from the congregation in that way. Congregations loved the fact that chaplains were associated with the local team, but they didn't evaluate the work that they did. When we asked about accountability and evaluation, we also asked about previous training that chaplains had, but also uh, ongoing professional development or trainings that were required such as mandatory reporter or boundary or what in the UK they call safeguarding training. And what we found was is that US-based chaplains did not have any required evaluations, um, but they also had no safeguarding or boundary training or professional development requirements. Now, one of the things that may uh, be brought about in this is the fact that these US-based chaplains I worked with were working in the NFL where there are no minors. However, um, even in the past few years, the Baylor University football chaplain was removed after allegations of sexual abuse had been disclosed to him and he did not report those. Um, so this is a really interesting and pertinent area and I'll discuss these in the avenues for growth later. The UK-based chaplains were required to complete safeguarding training. Um, this is a very, a far more regimented thing nationally in the UK than it here, is here in the US. And these chaplains may engage with people in the youth squads, making that even more important. Uh, to be a chaplain with Sports Chaplaincy UK, you have to go through safeguarding training. Um, but professional development, <coughs> excuse me, was also offered by the group um, throughout the year. The same uh, PD would be offered in different parts of the country, um, just so it was easier for chaplains to travel to. But we found um, that was some, a really interesting element when we asked about this accountability and evaluation, that chaplains were not um, necessarily, at least in the US, clued into their responsibilities in regards to reporting abuse and allegations, but also not knowing um, how to do that in their host organization and guaranteeing that that process would be confidential. Now, one of the interesting things um, that we found in the research was this element of marginalization. We asked no questions about the marginality or liminality of the chaplain, but it kept popping up, both with our chaplains who had little expectations and access, but also our chaplains who had a lot of expectations or access. Chaplains in the study felt very unified in the sense that they did not feel fully welcomed in their host organization, but they also felt like they played an, a role in the structure and system of the group. So they kind of had one foot in and one foot out. And this left the chaplains feeling very marginalized. Now, Stephen Pattison in the Handbook of Chaplaincy says, or argues that chaplaincy overall is an inherently marginal field 
given that chaplains are not vital to the host organization they serve. Um, as Michael reported, um, I'm a secondary school chaplain and you know, my, my boss could say my job is redundant tomorrow and the school could still function fine. But if she says that about um, our math department, we would lose our accreditation. Hence, I am, you know, in some ways, not vital to the school. And we find this in all forms of chaplaincy. And we find this in sports chaplaincy as well. You know, these people aren't calling the plays. They're not, uh, you know, healing athletes' wounded bodies. They are just um, there to serve in that way. And Pattison contends, while this is challenging, it can also be an advantage. And this is what we see here. But I want to talk about it first uh, in regards to the importance of the marginal or liminal figure. Uh, I looked at the work of Victor Turner, who's a famous anthropologist who studied African tribal rituals. Um, and in his work here, he also talks about society as a whole and the importance of ritual in it. And Turner argues, excuse me, that there are two poles in any society. There's structure, which is the hierarchical or regimented side of society that, inform, that enforces laws, norms, social constructs, things like that. But there's also communitas, which is a state of relational equality where these hierarchies do not exist. And Turner argues that you cannot live in one of these spaces at all times, that a society must kind of almost like a pendulum swing back and forth between the two. And Turner says and speaks often about the power of the symbolic figure who has a lesser position within the structure of the society but still conveys deep wisdom and insight within a specific situation. And this allows them to convey communitas. So Turner uses the example of the Middle Ages court jester. Who is the court jester? The court jester is a really strange person in the structure of a Middle Age community. He wears odd clothes. He might wear funny makeup. He kind of dances around. He's supposed to be kind of quirky and things like that. He doesn't really fit in with the knights. He doesn't fit in with the hardworking farmers. He doesn't fit in with the nobility. He's just this kind of odd space that is in the group. But what does the court jester or court joker do that no one else can? He can make fun of the king and the other leaders at specific times and when it's appropriate. And he's not going to be thrown in jail. His head's not off. He's not going to be shunned from the group. And in doing so, he can make fun of the king. And he can make fun of the issues that are going on in the community. And everybody can laugh, including the king. And that can convey a deep wisdom about what's happening in a specific situation. So we see that this, lim this marginal or liminal figure plays a key role in bringing apart an element of relational equality. And I contend um, that the chaplain is a conveyor of this communitas as well. And chaplains within the study conveyed communitas in three different ways. They conveyed it at times of bereavement, time of tension within the club, and when there was a place for a relationship of equality with the manager. And I want to share a brief story with you, a quote I, I pulled from my interviews to kind of show how this works. Uh, the name and the team name of the person I'm going to speak of uh, have been changed for anonymity's sake, but it's one of the UK-based chaplains. And he said, I suddenly got a call from the manager. <clears throat> he, and he said, you heard about a player? And I said, no. And he said, well, yesterday his girlfriend lost their baby, and it was in the press and everything. And the manager said, I want you to come in tomorrow before the next game because we're blokes and nobody wants to talk about it. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to cope with it. The lads don't. But I want you to come in and I want you to do a three-minute talk to the squad before the next game. But we need to be careful. You need to think about it carefully because I want it to motivate them because it's the biggest game in our life as a club. So as we lay out this scene, we see all three elements present. A time of loss, a late third, tri late third trimester pregnancy that required stillbirth. We see tension within the club. We don't know how to deal with all these emotions, but they're affecting us. But we also see a space of relational equality with the head coach, the manager. Who gives the team talk before a game? The head coach. What is the chaplain being asked to do? He's being asked to fill that space in this time of need. And this is what um, we're going to call this guy Lewis, what Lewis did, what he said occurred. 
sorry. I did this thing before the game, got everybody there. You know, it was an absolute privilege with the player there and everything. There's lots of tears, but we just acknowledged what we were and how we were to go forward. And just everybody embraced and acknowledged it. And this was the powerful line. It's like we put stillbirth. We put death right in the midst of us before the game. And it was just an amazing moment in the changing rooms with the entire squad. And then we went out and won. And that was a chaplaincy moment that was pretty unique. So here we see this chaplain who has this, you know, uses his marginal liminal um, position to come in in this time of tension and pain and loss and to acknowledge what the group was going through and provide an element of equality and community that was needed before they went out uh, before this very, very important and huge game. So what I can, you know, what we conclude in our study is that while the chaplain is um, in a marginal position and why this may, while this may seem like a challenge, it's actually a place of necessity because it's in this location that the chaplain can offer the communitas that the world of elite sports cannot provide itself. You know, these elite sports bubbles are places of high tension, of, you know, amazing physical and mental skill and ability of competition. They are the peak, the pinnacle of their craft and trade, but they cannot provide pastoral care in the same way that a chaplain can. And so by having a chaplain with them, they are allow themselves to be able to have these moments of communitas. They have someone within their midst who can help them make sense of these things that they can't make sense of otherwise. And that's a really powerful role the chaplain plays. Before I conclude today, I just want to um, highlight some areas of growth within sports chaplaincy. And then I'll also highlight some research areas going forward. Um, a place I think sports chaplaincy needs to grow is safeguarding and boundary training for U.S.-based chaplains. Um, no chaplain, as I said, had had boundary or mandatory, tra uh, mandatory reporter training, but they also had not done any CPE or chaplaincy-specific training. Um, and previous literature has addressed this element of CPE, but not of mandatory reporter or boundary training. Um, what concerned me just for the guys I worked with, because I, you know, you grow to care for your, these people you're doing research with because you get to interact with them a lot. Um, none of them knew the process of filing a confidential report in their organization. And so there was this level of protection that they did not have that I think is really important for us to help promote for sports chaplains in the U.S. Another thing is encouraging host organizations to provide accountability structures that are consistent and show that uh, the chaplain's work is A, valued, and B, um, is per, not just self-reflective in its evaluation. Um, so this could be not only just with individual in organizations, but also leagues as a whole helping to facilitate this quality care. Some areas of growth in sports chaplaincy research that I see, there's a ton. Uh, my research is the first qualitative study that is international in this sense and compares chaplaincy in various leagues. So, and there's a lot of leagues and a lot of things where chaplaincy has not been studied. So what does chaplaincy look like at a moto track or at a horse racing track where you have people who are coming through? It's not the same group of people every week. How does that change what the chaplain does? Uh, I would think it'd be really interesting to look at baseball chapel, which is primarily with, um, focuses on Sunday morning worship for the home team, the away team, and umpires. How does that look? Bible studies or you know, engagement with the host organization doesn't always happen there. I think there's also research to be done on continuing to understand how chaplains are trained and avenues you can support them through professional development. And then finally, I think that um, how sports chaplains are perceived by executives and others, uh, league officials, either at their host organization or at a league office is a really interesting area to work in as well. Um, my study focused on how sports chaplains perceive their own work. So how do people in these host organizations or in the leagues as a whole, or even the athletes perceive the work of the chaplain? That would be something also very interesting to look at. Um, but really what we see in chaplaincy is a new, uh, a lot of new research in an emerging field um, that continues to grow both in regards to those who are practicing it and uh, in regards to the work that is done academically. So at this time, I think we're ready for some Q&A. 
Um, so thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to pass it over to Michael for this. I have not looked at the chat at all, so, or the Q&A at all. So please uh, enlighten me as to what we got. Well, thank you, Will. That was uh, enlightening, to, to use your word. And this is, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is something that we know exists, but we don't know about on the same level as some other sectors of chaplaincy, like healthcare chaplaincy. So uh, I'm very appreciative, not only of your time, but also your work and where it's going to develop into the future. So let's dive into the questions here uh, as we get towards the top of the hour. Um, and I, some of these have to do with just the basic demographics of sports chaplaincy, but I think that's really interesting in a way. First question. Are most of these chaplains men? Um, the ones in my study were yes, and a lot of them uh, I did find were, but that's also, it depends on the league as well. Um, so for example, um, there are female chat, I know of at least one, uh, a female chaplain who works with the LPGA and also with women's uh, professional tennis, the WTA, and works with the females there. So it is really, a lot of it has to do with the gender of the competition is often the gender of the chaplain. Um, and so that is something we tend to see. Um, but um, I know, for example, the woman who's really done a lot of pioneering work in sports chap or, or gym chaplaincy in the UK, uh, she's female. And she also, interestingly, her organization does a lot of work with nightclub chaplaincy as well, yeah. which is this also really interesting recreational space. So yeah, predominantly male, but also it de really depends on the group. So yeah. And are there any Muslim sports chaplains? To my knowledge, no. Um, I will admit that there is a book called uh, Dribbling for uh, Dawala, which is all about Muslim Americans' interactions with sports. It might engage with chaplaincy there. Um, but I know uh, very few uh, chaplains who are Muslim. Um, none of, I interact with none of them in that way. In the UK, a number of the chaplains I had worked with had helped uh, Muslim players find local mosques uh -huh. uh, one had actually helped and kind of been a support as a player talked about ramadan and what that meant to his team so his teammates would know what that would be like for him and he came in and supported him through that um, but no these are predominantly and almost exclusively christian chaplains and that's a, another huge area for growth um, i think another question that needs to be asked is as we see the rise of the religious nuns particularly in 20 somethings which make up the majority of professional athletes what does it look to have more of a spiritualist bend to that chaplaincy or a non a, a non-denominational in the sense of non-sectarian uh, look to chaplaincy as well as these demographic shift in society right right this is really interesting because it touches on not just sports chaplaincy but an issue in chaplaincy in many places. Is the option of not compensating sports chaplains based on ethical, organizational, or legal reasons, and I'm assuming he means in the UK, sort of the setup of, of how the clubs are set up, but volunteer chaplains, why does that end up happening? Um, so I don't have a specific reason. I, I will actually say that one of them is, it, I don't know how many of these chaplains uh, how many of these organizations would elect to have a chaplain they had to pay in all honesty sure you know it's kind of that thing where you know what am i going to pay to do this no but boy if you volunteer to help me sure i'll take a free set of hands and an interesting yeah. and an interesting area that we can then say we're filling as organization um so i think that plays into it i think where we see the ethical elements or affiliation comes in particular with uh, American universities, if particularly state schools who offer athletics and uh, a, a desire to, um, there have been a number of different articles written and people who have brought up issues of church state violation um, with Christian chaplains being as affiliated and associated with um, teams that are at state funded universities. Right. Um, but no, I think a lot of it has to do with look, we're running a business here. And if we don't have to pay you for your services, that's fine. Um, I also, you know, when I talk to the chaplains, a lot of them really just enjoy this work. Um, you know, a lot of the chaplains in the UK were parish pastors, and this was three or four hours of their week where they were still doing a ministry that engaged them, but it wasn't with the same 150 to 500 people. And that was really liberating. Um, and it was a unique thing. I think we can all speak to times in our life where we've done something for two or three hours in a week, but we feel invigorated for everything else because we've done it. 
Right. Um, but no, I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact of offering path, like, I think offering a listening ear and then being required to be paid for my listening kind of sends a mixed message at times as well. Sure. Um, so I think there are a lot of those different elements there, yeah. but there's no specific reason behind it. Another question that crosses not only sports chaplaincy, but into many other fields, you mentioned Victor Turner. What resources do you recommend to explore the marginalization aspect of chaplaincy? And we all know what this means. In some organizations, chaplains are right there in the heart and in others, they're tolerated. So if we, yeah. if someone wants to learn more about the marginalization of the profession within institutions, where do you go? I think that uh, Stephen Patterson's work in 2015 is really helpful. Um, but, you know, and I actually am going to look to you for some of the wider chaplaincy literature as well, just because you know that so well. His is really there, but I don't know tons of studies who have looked at different groups of chaplaincy and how they understand their marginality. Um, I'm looking at getting my article published on that. If there's any publishers on here, I'd be more than happy to chat with somebody about that. Um, but I'd say that is a really, I think Turner is a great place to start and Pattison and the Handbook of Chaplaincy. Um, I have it behind me. I can pull it up in a second if people would like. But um, those would be the two places I would go. And I'd actually encourage people who are here as chaplains. You know, I'm an education chaplain, like I've said. And I, I sit on one of our leadership teams. And I even feel very marginal at my institution. But I think that as chaplains, marginality is an easy place for us to go. This is very frustrating. And after we release that feeling of frustration, I think it is a really powerful place to go. How can I leverage this to the best of my ability? Right. Um, it is very helpful. And in fact, I've found it's more challenging now that I'm on a leadership team to be that marginal presence because I'm affiliated with one of the official structures of the group and one of the structures of our school that's going to leverage some of those things and power in a power dynamic. So that lack of a power dynamic while painful, while frustrating also provides us with such a wild card that we as chaplains can use in positive ways. Um, so I would suggest looking at Pattison's handbook. Um, it, it's a UK based book. There's a lot of different case studies in it and uh -huh. it looks at different chaplaincies and it's, a, it's wonderful. I quote it heavily in my dissertation. Um, a Theology of Chaplaincy by I wanna say it's Todd is also very helpful. I believe that came out in 2018. Um, I'm not allowed in my office. I'm in my home office and I have a books, a, a stack of books behind me um, that, I that I can suggest as well that I just don't have as readily available. Um, I'd encourage that person to reach out to me on social media or email wise and I can provide you some of those sort of citations. And I'll also plug an event that we'll have here uh, in a couple of weeks. We're wrapping up a project right now that is a deep dive into the, the process and the thoughts on the, on the part of decision makers within healthcare organizations on what chaplaincy does and is and where it is situated. We're finishing that project up right now, so there will be some published results at some point, and then we're also going to have a webinar on that uh, at the end of the month. So this, it, it's sort of a technical answer to this question about marginalization, but it will give some really clear illustrations of how people that have you know, power over what chaplaincy does, think about the profession fitting within uh, an organization. Uh, here's another good question. Health chaplaincy or healthcare chaplaincy typically requires the advocacy of a spiritual organization and ordination, or, or I might say endorsement. So do sports chaplains need to be associated with a particular organization and do they have to be ordained? Uh, the basic answer is no. Um, I will say that when you look at a place like the NFL, this was very interesting. I, I alluded to this briefly. The NFL is such a closed community for so many different reasons, not just its popularity, but also its competition level. It's a very niche thing. And so actually having, like being affiliated with a group like Athletes in Action or with some of these groups or knowing a chaplain is a really helpful way for chaplains to get in or teams might, or coaches might go looking to these places because they have previous trust with them. Um, it is not uncommon for to find people on social media or pastors saying they're the team chaplain, the X team, and they spoke to the team one time. And guess what? The team actually didn't really enjoy their talk and they weren't invited back, but they know how much power that association can have in our society. 
So there is no requirement of affiliation. That affiliation helps with connection in that way and the previous trust. That can be a place where affiliation helps. Um, and ordination, not necessarily, uh, but I do think it helps when people want to get ordained or, or married or things of that nature. Um, and a lot of these people, you know, they want people who are, even though it's a volunteer, they want people who are functional and capable in pastoral care and ministry skills. And oftentimes, to become qualified in those, oftentimes you end up ordained. Um, but I will say that I don't think that it's a hindrance, particularly with amateur athletics. I saw um, that one of the people asked about it with amateur athletics and things that, especially with high schools, I think providing a neutral presence and saying, look, I'm here to care for you regardless of win, lose, or draw. You as the human being is what I care for. That is a place that is even antithetical in high-end high school athletics. And that's a really powerful space. And that can be something as simple as offering that service at a local high school or at a local organization. Or maybe I saw someone say, how do you get involved in something like that? Is there a major softball or tournament that's going to happen in your area? And is it over a weekend? And can you say, look, I'd love to offer a worship service in the parking lot for people who might be interested. And I'm going to be here all weekend just to hang out if people want to chat. Those are great entry and access points for local chaplains. Um, I think that sports chaplaincy at the high school level is a great thing. That's what a lot of my ministry is based off of pseudo sports chaplaincy. Um, I spend a lot of my time during the week um, engaging with our athletes and going to practices and showing up and taking an interest in them. Um, I think that people desire to be known and they desire to be loved. And if you can show people that you know and love them, it doesn't matter if you're ordained or not, that's going to provide a space for connection and engagement that's really powerful. And it occurs to me that if we think about uh, chaplaincy for high school sports, some of those questions about the appropriateness of a chaplain on a public school team, that would be ramped up even, even more loudly than within, uh, you know, a higher education setting um, for, for a variety of reasons, which I'm not saying one thing or the other, but I can imagine that would be a, a big um, point of dispute. A huge point of dispute, but you know, these high schools might also have FCA groups that kids are choosing to go to. Right. And that, you know, so it's how do you provide this in a way that is, um, you know, and even at our own school, while we have a school minister here, we're not technically a religious school. So I actually don't have, our school doesn't have a religious mandate. So my position is very unique in that way. So really when I chat about my chaplaincy, it has nothing to do with my place as, as a Christian pastor, which I am. It has everything to do with me trying to offer a care, uh, trying to offer a service that our coaches that are and that our traders can't offer, nor should they. You know, the head coach is paid of the soccer team is paid to produce a high quality varsity soccer team, not to come alongside guys. I mean, they need to, but it's not their primary focus. Right. And so I think that that's it's a very helpful thing in that way. Um, can I answer Leonard Gaines's question of how does one apply for positions as sports chaplains? It's really uh, kind of a shoot your shot type thing. Looking at local, where is a local air, a need in your area and seeing if a chap, something in chaplaincy might interest them. Be prepared to either hear they have someone, be prepared to hear they don't know them decline it. But I, my encouragement to people who are interested in getting in, involved in sports chaplaincy um, is to just go out there and try and find a niche you're interested in and to engage with. The biggest thing you have to remember as a sports chaplain is you are there to serve the community. You are not there to be the number one fan. I know of numerous chaplaincy searches that have ended with qualified candidates who have started to ask about tickets and gear or if they can bring their families to games. The minute that someone says, can I bring my child with me to the game, that candidate is then gone. You are there, your priority is to deal with these people as humans, not as the, you know, one rung below a deity that we place them in society because um, they can find that anywhere, but they right. can't find someone who's going to engage with them as a individual in that way. Right. Um, and that is a huge part of chaplaincy. It was amazing how many times these chaplains go, people put these people on pedestals. They are so normal. It's boring. Yeah. You know, and that's a huge part of it. 
So I would encourage you, Leonard, to look into those local avenues. There might be places where those things. Um, if you have a local university near you, uh, looking to see if they have a chap, if they already have a chaplain who might need help. Also, say you have a small university that has one chaplain, they might love to have a, someone who can help with one or two teams because it's going to ease their load and let them provide higher quality care too. Right. Thank you so much for this, Will. This is just, it, it's endlessly fascinating because um, it's one of those areas that our knowledge about it can only grow uh, in, the, in the, mm -hmm. you know, it's such an open field that, uh, you know, anything that's produced here is going to be interesting. So um, we really appreciate your time. I'll remind everybody that this has been recorded. And so it will go up on the website here in the next couple of days. It's because you're registered, you'll get uh, an email to that recording automatically. And so you can uh, check back on any material that you might have missed. And then we'll post the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation as well with that. So you can get all that information on demand as well. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, check out our schedule at chaplaincyinnovation.org where we have all of our webinars listed. Will, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Michael. I hope you all have a wonderful day and enjoy your summer wherever you guys are at. Wonderful. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.